Does God change his mind? Well, it might look like it, but he doesn't. In the Bible, there are passages that seem to say or show or appear that God changes his mind. As a matter of fact, sometimes the wording that we have in English gives us the picture that God actually changes his mind. But the fact is, he doesn't. So what I want to do is look at some of these passages and I also want to address something else that comes up as a uh, as a as a natural byproduct of that. And it shouldn't be. But there are those who have this view that we call open theism, which means that God either does not know or he chooses to not know. There's a huge problem with that. And it really is not a very thought out statement. As a matter of fact, it undermines who God is, the character of God, the quality of God and just the power of God. But before we get to that, let's go to some of these passages, such as in Genesis 6, 6. And this is after evil is just spreading upon the land. And then the Bible says in verse 6 that the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And then the word that's used here for sorry is this Hebrew word, nacham, which means to repent or relent. And so some verses may even say that the God repented uh, that he had made uh man this way or that he had made man. Another passage that we see a couple other times is in Exodus 32. Exodus 32, 14, this is Moses pleading on behalf of the children of Israel to God. And the Bible says, so the Lord God, look what it says, changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Well, what's the case? Does God change his mind? Again, the same word that's used here in this particular passage is the Hebrew word for Naham. And that word is also in Genesis 6. Now, I want to go to another passage so we can make our point. And this is 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 11. This has happened. This, this is also stated again later on in 1 Samuel 15. But he says, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me. And the word for regret or repented is the same Hebrew word for Nacham, which means to relent, uh, to regret, or to uh, change his mind. Does God actually change his mind? Well, the answer is no. Now, what you need to also remember, and we'll bring this up again, is that it's not that God changes his mind, but you know what God does have the power to do? He has the power to change your mind, to change our mind. We'll talk about that later, but let's deal with 1 Samuel 15 as well as Exodus 13. I mean, sorry, Exodus 32, as well as Genesis 6. Think about the very first promise that God made, this very first plan that we see. This is in Genesis 3, after the fall, and then God has Satan, the devil, the serpent, as well as Adam and Eve lined up, and he makes a statement in Genesis 3.15. He says, and I will put enmity, this is him making a statement, a promise of what he's going to do, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So here is God planning out what he is going to do. All of the details aren't shown up, but God is still promising these things to happen. Well, how can he promise that? How can he promise to put enmity between her seed, that is Jesus, and his seed, that is his followers, as well as uh, the serpent as well? How can he promise to do so? Well, because remember, God is God. We are not. And so what God is doing, what we see in the scriptures is God is using words that we can understand. It's almost like talking to a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a 10-year-old. You cannot talk to them the exact same way that you would talk to a 30 or 40-year-old. Why? Because of level of understanding. And so what God has to do is he has to use what's called anthropomorphic terminology or words that we as human beings can understand. And so sometimes it gives the appearance, in this case, that God is changing his mind. But remember, God is the one planning things out. So if we go back to Genesis 6, he says that he was sorry that he had made man, did God know what was going to happen? And by the way, being sorry does not mean that you still would not do it again or you didn't know what was going to happen. That happens. There are things that we can say, we use this term, it's regrettable that these things happen, but I still intended and would do it again, even though it's regrettable what the outcome is. God is simply saying that it grieves him in his heart. It grieves him of how uh, or what man is doing. It makes him sorrowful for these things, but he knows full well. How do we know? Because he's the one that literally sent the, the, the serpent uh, down to earth to do these things, knowing full well what, what was going to happen. It is not as though that God, it was God was caught off guard. As a matter of fact, 
God is literally seeing these things unfold before him in the garden. And he, he has the power to stop it, but he doesn't. He has the power to destroy Satan, but he doesn't. Why? Because he's going to bring about something that brings a greater glory to him and fully fleshes out his plan. Let's go to Exodus 32. He says to Noah, to, to Moses that he's going to destroy them, basically starting over with Moses. The problem is, though, he can't start over with Moses. Why? Because Moses is not out of the tribe of Judah. Remember, Genesis 49 tells us that the scepter shall not depart Judah. So we know the very seed that was spoken of in Genesis 3 is going to re is referring to Jesus. And so he could not come out of Moses. Moses is not out of the tribe of Judah. He's out of the tribe of Benjamin. And so all he's doing is using Moses to speak up. And oh, by the way, how this works in terms of God changing his mind, he's not changing his mind, but what he is doing is he's speaking about an action that he is going to do the, to the people. What happens though, is if the situation on the ground changes, then so too does God. Let me give you an example. I have a two-year-old who might decide, not a, my own two-year-old, but a grandchild, or you may have a child. And you may say to that child, if this child is on a course of doing something, you might say, I am going to do this to punish you. For example, if the child is pretending to, I don't know, let's have doing some bad parenting and he's got a knife in his hand and he's going to go and stick it into the outlet. And I say, I'm going to spank you. Well, the child stops. He changes his mind. He comes back. And then what do I do? I then change what I'm going to do because the situation has changed. I have not really changed my mind. I intend to punish this child if they do this to stop them. But the situation changes. Think about what happens with Moses. He makes his plea. And then what does what does he do? He goes to the people and the people repent of what they were doing. Now, do they repent forever? No, <laughs> the sin in them continues. But this is what God is showing here. Same thing in first Samuel chapter one, verse uh, chapter 15, verse 11. He says, I regret that I've made Saul king. Now, understand these things that are happening. God has already determined that he is going to have a king uh, to lead mankind. Again, going back to Genesis 49, where he says the scepter should not depart Judah. Saul is not of Judah. He's of Benjamin. Did God know that? Sure, he knows that. He tells Samuel that they have not rejected you, but they rejected me. Did God know these things? Sure. If he didn't want it to happen, he could have simply destroyed them or some of them and caused them to keep following him. Or he could have chosen David at the very onset. But God is trying to bring about something else. He's trying to fully flesh out his plan. And so when he makes this statement in First Samuel 15, he's not stating that he is um, that he made a mistake. I didn't know that Saul is not in the tribe of Judah. God knows these things. He's not saying, oh, I'm caught off guard all of a sudden. As a matter of fact, if we go further in first Samuel 15, let's go to verse 29. He says, also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. And the word that's used is the same word in the com for he is not a man that he should change his mind. And what's the word here again? The word Nacham. And so the Bible is telling us here, Seems like a contradiction that he's changing his mind. But one, he says he's not a man, which we do change our mind. We can lie, but not God. God is not a man that he should lie, nor that he's a man that he would change his mind. He does not change his mind. As a matter of fact, what does the Bible tell us? The very same word from the com um, is, is changed and used differently. God doesn't change his mind, even though it might appear to us that he does change his mind. But we go to other passages such as Malachi 3, 6. What does it say? For I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So his point to them is that I'm not going to destroy you, Israel, even though it might have looked like that. Some of you will be, but I, the Lord, do not change. What does he mean? I have already have a plan that I've stated, that I've pronounced, and I'm not going to change from that. I, the Lord, do not change. Who he has always been is who he is now and who he will always be. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, out of this comes a view, a philosophy that honestly is just not very well thought out. Uh, there's this view called open theism. Open theism is not biblical. It's unbiblical. As a matter of fact, it's ungodly. Is that to say that those that hold to that view that they are not saved? It could be that they are not saved. It also may very well be that they're just not uh, understanding that they're 
supplanting their own intellect and they're just missing it. And if they're missing it, in this case, they are missing it badly. Open theism supposes that God either doesn't know all things or he chooses not to know some things. That is a ridiculous statement. Again, this is them imagining God to be like them. If they were God, the question is, why would God allow some of these evil things to happen? Well, he didn't see these things happening or he chooses not to see these things, these things happen. But that's not the case, because if when these things are happening before his eyes, he could have stopped them right then and there. He's not powerless to stop those things, but he continues to let these things happen. Why? Because they bring about further what he intends to do, what he's planned to do. Remember, the Bible says also that God knows all things in whatever our hearts condemn us for God is greater than our hearts and know and he that is God knows all things we don't God knows everything he knows the intents of our heart according to the scriptures before we even think it before it comes out of our mouth God already knows those things he knows he knows what we would do what we should do what we could do he certainly knows what he will do. He knows what the end is before it. The Bible tells us that God knows all things. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Think about his conversation that he has with Job. There is nothing that escapes God. And so the Bible says that even in that, behold, in Isaiah 42, 9, behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things, therefore they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. So what God said would happen, did happen. What God said is happening now is happening. And what is going to happen, God declares those things to happen too. Now, we can get into the weeds as to does he declare every single thing to happen? Does he declare uh, and determine that I would wear this shirt on this day, that I would choose this frame of glasses, that you would drink the drink that you're drinking later on the day? We're not worried so much about that, but in terms of the things that he has told us that he's going to do, he does. In terms of things that where he tells us that we are going to do, he it, they happen. Why? Because he knows all of these things. And even though there are occasions that might cause an open theist to think that, wait a second, he clearly doesn't know all of these things because the wording that's used, such as when Jesus makes a statement, who we know is God, he says, I don't know. Well, how is that? I don't know. I don't know when the kingdom or when the when these things shall happen, when the return shall be. Well, is God saying that he doesn't know? No. What he states is that it's, I don't know, but only the father knows, knows what, when he will come and bring the bride in. Well, that speaks to a Jewish culture of a wedding feast. And so when the son is betrothed through to his bride, that it's the father who then determines and makes the announcement of when the wedding feast is going to be. In the meantime, the son is doing what? Preparing a place for the bride, either on the father's property inside the house or on the ground. And so that's what Jesus says in John 14. But he's not stating, I don't know. I have no idea. Remember, he was there in the beginning in this council. He was the one that, that put together, according to Hebrews, that put together this covenant and determined these things. And so it's not as though he has no idea what's going on. He's just speaking to them to get them to think about what God's plans are. God is the one that says that it is wrong to make a vow and then to break that vow. Are we saying that God has vowed to do something and he has no idea which causes him possibly the potential to break the vow? That would make God a hypocrite. God is the one who swears by heaven of what he is going to do. We're told not to do so because heaven and earth aren't ours, but they are his. They are his throne. And are we going to find God to be a liar? That God is making things up? God is not Las Vegas. He's not laying odds or he's not playing a strong hunch, taking an educated guess. He is God. What does that mean? He says that he is the one declaring the end from the beginning in Isaiah 46 and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God is God. You are not. And when you try to get in the position to try to explain his mind, you do yourself a disservice and you distort the picture of God to other people. It is one of the most foolish philosophies that any purported or proposed or confessed Christian could ever make that God either chooses not to know or he doesn't know. That puts him in the same realm as you and I. And what's always happened since the beginning of time, man has tried to do one of three things as it relates to God. One, get rid of God altogether, or two, accept there's a God. And in that, we'll either try to bring ourselves up to God's level and see him eye to eye or bring God down to our level so we can look eye to eye 
in other words, making God out to be a God like us. This is where this comes from. He doesn't know everything or he chooses not to. God, the Bible is clear. He knows all things. And so as it relates to him changing his mind, he would not have to change his mind if what he declares, he already knows what the end is. It's almost like us watching a movie and explaining what's going to happen to someone who's never watched a movie, who's asking us questions. And then periodically we tell them what is going to happen in the movie and we seem accurate. Why? Because we know the end from the beginning. Well, unlike us, we don't. God doesn't just know the end from the beginning. The Bible says that he, those things, he's declared the end from the beginning. And so since he's not a man that he should lie, according to the scriptures, then we can rest that he does not change his mind. He does make errors. He's not fallible. He is infallible. And what he says will come to pass. Amen.